Good evening. My name is Kate McGrail, Program Manager in the Community Health and Wellness Department at Suburban Hospital. Thank you for joining us this evening on what to watch for, atrial fibrillation. As part of the hospital's commitment to care for the health and well-being of its community members, we hope that this evening will be educational and informative. Tonight, we will hear from Dr. Rani Hassan, Director of the Interventional Cardiology Fellowship Program, as he will discuss atrial fibrillation, or AFib, and the latest minimally invasive procedures used to treat this condition. As part of the hospital's commitment to care for the health and well being of its community members, we hope that this evening will be both educational and informative. Before we start, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items. Tonight we are on Zoom webinar. This means all participants will remain on mute throughout the evening. You will be able to submit questions throughout the session at any time by typing in the Q&A box. You will find that at the bottom of your screen. We are recording tonight's presentation and we will make it available in the coming days. Last but not least, your feedback is very important to us and helps us build strong programming for future events. A link to our anonymous evaluation will be sent at the end of this program. We kindly ask that you take a moment to complete it as it helps the staff at Suburban in planning future programming for our community. Thank you. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hassan. Ronnie Hassan is an attending interventional cardiologist at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, Johns Hopkins Baby Medical Center, and Suburban Hospital, as well as an assistant professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Hassan is board certified in cardiovascular diseases and interventional cardiology by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Hassan received his medical degree from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He completed a residency in internal medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, followed by fellowships in cardiovascular disease, interventional cardiology, and an advanced fellowship in instructional heart and peripheral vascular interventions at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He's also earned a Master's of Health Science in Clinical Investigation from Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health and served as Chief Fellow in the Division of Cardiology. So Dr. Hassan, welcome. And we are ready for you to share your slides. All right, well, thank you for the very uh, kind introduction and uh, also uh, thank you for organizing this and for uh, the um, honor of inviting me. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction tonight, we're gonna be talking about what to watch for with atrial fibrillation. Um, and so I will kind of start by just uh, giving us kind of an overview of this topic. Um, I, well, I'm primarily based at uh, the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. I've had a longstanding relationship with Suburban Hospital. I currently serve as the regional medical director for our structural heart disease program, um, which has been in existence since about 2015 when I started coming down there. And I'm usually there three or four times a month. Um, and I've helped to develop treatments for uh, mostly heart valve disease that we now perform um, at Suburban Hospital as part of a, a team of uh, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons there. And one of the things I'll talk about tonight is going to hopefully be the next chapter of that program. So I have no relevant uh, financial or other disclosures uh, relevant to this presentation tonight. So here's the outline we're going to follow. And it's going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour. And this is a big topic. And I'm not going to attempt to be exhaustive, but try to kind of give you a little bit of a bird's eye view and then focus in on some uh, of a relatively new minimally invasive procedure that we are currently performing to help manage this condition. 
So we'll talk about what is atrial fibrillation, uh, what are the complications that can result from this condition, what are risk factors for it that could be potentially modifiable, what is the general kind of management of atrial fibrillation, and then we'll focus on strategies to prevent stroke because that is really the major complication that we worry about with this condition. So again, what is atrial fibrillation? Yeah, you'll hear this commonly referred to in medical parlance as AFib or AF, um, and it is the most common abnormal heart rhythm we see in adults. It affects between 2.1 and 6.1 million Americans, and it occurs in up to 2% of adults who are less than age 65 and up to 9% who are greater than age 65. Additionally, it accounts for almost 500,000 hospitalizations in, in the United States and almost 100,000 deaths here in the United States alone. And that's just US statistics that doesn't take into account the global burden of disease. And this is costly. It has an annual cost burden of almost $9,000 per capita amongst uh, US Medicare beneficiaries and about $26 billion in aggregate annually in the United States. So, in order to understand what atrial fibrillation is, we need to understand what our normal heart's um, conduction is like. So while the heart is a pump, uh, um, which I can appreciate as kind of being a plumber of that pump, um, the heart also has an electrical system. And that is responsible for setting our heart rate and rhythm. And under normal circumstances, we have what's called normal sinus rhythm where we have our built-in metronome of our heart, or what's called the sinoatrial node, our built-in pacemaker over, over here on the far left side of the screen, where you see where this little blue blood vessel comes into our right atrium, that starts our heart rhythm, and it starts it by triggering an electrical signal. And our heart muscle tissue actually has specialized fibers that can very rapidly conduct this electrical signal, just like an electrical circuit. And that signal gets transmitted through the atria and then down rapidly to the ventricles through specialized muscular fibers or bundles of, of fibers that then allow our heart to beat in a nice synchronized way. So we get that characteristic love dub, love dub. <clears throat> and that is represented, those electrical signals are represented graphically at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom left, you see these three nice kind of first soft bump, then a very sharp spike, and then another soft bump. And that's the typical pattern we would see on an electrocardiogram um, for somebody who is in a normal rhythm. Now we contrast that to atrial fibrillation on the far right, where instead of having this very orderly production and transmission of electrical signals through the heart muscle tissue, you have this chaotic uh, collection of basically multiple fo foci of electrical signaling that occur in the atria. So just all over the place, you have these chaotic electro signals being generated and going round and round in various little small circles. And then, and those are at very, very rapid rates, sometimes in excess of 300 beats per minute. Mind you, a normal heart rate is somewhere on the order of 50 to say 100 beats per minute. And you can maybe get up into the 110s, 120s, maybe close to 180 if you're really exercising vigorously. So 300 is really very rapid and it's usually 300 plus. And that, not all of those th signals, thankfully, are transmitted to the pumping chambers. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to live with this. We have a built-in resistor that will slow down that, um, that electrical signal, but it still is too fast, typically, for whatever we're, we're doing. And this, if this is occurring at rest. Somebody's heart rate might be much higher than it should be for somebody at rest. And this is depicted graphically on the electrocardiogram here as this very chaotic wiggling line at the bottom with the bigger spikes being the, the electrical signals that are being transmitted to the pumping chambers, again, at a more rapid rate than normal, but not as rapid as what is occurring up in the filling chambers called the atria. Now, the complications come from really two basic mechanisms. One is the heart rate is too fast. And the other is, instead of the filling chambers up top beating in a nice synchronous way, they're basically sitting there quivering very rapidly, and that can predispose uh, us to form blood clots in the nooks and crannies of this chamber, and we'll get back to that later. But those blood clots can then be sent to other parts of the body, namely to the brain, and those can cause strokes. And so when we look at the complications of atrial fibrillation, 
The, may, the most important ones are stroke. And if you have atrial fibrillation, you're at five times higher risk of having stroke than somebody who does not have atrial fibrillation. Heart failure is three times more likely in the setting of AFib than in patients who don't have AFib. Dementia um, is double the risk. And you also have double the risk of dying when compared to somebody similar who does not have atrial fibrillation. What are the risk factors for atrial fibrillation? Well, the most common one is, is increasing age. Now, it's not, not something that, that most people can obviously control, uh, but it's something that is observed simply epidemiologically, that it's a more common problem as, as we get older. Um, hypertension or high blood pressure, um, diabetes mellitus, valvular heart disease, whether it be aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation, are probably the most common ones that we see. Coronary heart disease, or if you've had an, a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, um, can certainly increase the risk. Having heart failure puts you at risk for atrial fibrillation, which can then cause more heart failure. And then um, thyroid disease, specifically hyperthyroidism, is, is associated with the increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Obesity and obstructive sleep apnea, which often go together, are both associated with increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Cigarette smoking, alcohol use, in particular heavy alcohol use. If you have cardiac surgery, that is open heart surgery, simply the manipulation of the heart required for those procedures often increases the risk of atrial fibrillation to the extent that mo for most open heart surgeries, your, your preoperative risk of atrial fibrillation is, is, is assessed and oftentimes uh, medication strategies are undertaken to reduce that risk. And then another thing that we really don't have control over, but it's simply observed that people who are of European ancestry tend to be a higher risk for AFib. Oops, sorry, wrong button there. All right, so when we think about the management of atrial fibrillation in just very general terms, we're working on number one, managing symptoms typically. And there's two general strategies to do that, uh, that have, have kind of been historically considered. The first is rate control. And these are medications basically to control the rate in particular of the pumping chambers um, to prevent them from going too fast. There are two general classes of medications that we use for this, um, beta blockers, and then another class called cal calcium channel blockers. And these basically work on the heart's resistor and other electrical components to slow down the electrical conduction and slow down the heart rate in the setting of atrial fibrillation. And until relatively recently, um, we generally thought that rate control in general was probably the best option particularly for older patients that is older than the age of 65, let's say, as compared to, try to trying to control the actual rhythm. Um, indeed, many patients who are older may not feel as many symptoms, but we know if the heart rate is too fast that that can lead to weakening of the heart muscle over time. So it is still important to control the heart rate. Rhythm control refers to trying to get somebody who is an AFib back into a normal rhythm, not just to control the heart rate, but to actually convert the rhythm into what we call normal sinus rhythm. And in historically, the first line for treatment uh, with even rhythm control or medications, which are collectively called antiarrhythmic drugs. And they actually have direct impacts on the conduction of electricity, the conduction and production of electricity by the heart muscle cells at the cellular level. Now, historically, these weren't as well favored because if anybody has any other type of heart disease, whether it be coronary heart disease, heart failure in particular, um, these medications can cause adverse effects and be potentially toxic and lead to an increased risk of complications, including death. So we found that there are many patients who are not appropriate candidates for these medications. And again, they can cause other side effects. And so they kind of fell out of vogue um, because even if you got somebody into a normal rhythm, you often dealt with the, um, the adverse effects of the medications themselves. Um, more recently, with some of the newer medications that have come about, um, there is more enthusiasm to at least try rhythm control one time, at least give everybody one shot at getting back into normal rhythm, usually with a combination of medications and a procedure we call cardioversion, which is directly using infusion medication or applying electricity in the setting of, of sedation to basically jolt the heart back into a normal rhythm or reset the rhythm. Um, and this can be very effective, um, particularly uh, when used in combination with medications. 
the other strategy for um, for heart rhythm control that is gaining popularity um, is catheter ablation. Um, now, I will give a caveat here that um, a lot of the, this type of management is now done largely with the help of a cardiac electrophysiologist, or what I would call a cardiac electrician. And I'm an interventional cardiologist. I'm kind of the, the plumber. Um, but all of us in cardiology deal with atrial fibrillation, but catheter ablation has really been the mainstay of our cardiac electrophysiologists. And initially, these procedures were limited in their ability to successfully and durably uh, get rid of atrial fibrillation. But as the technology and techniques have improved, particularly over the past couple of decades or so, this procedure is increasingly coming to the fore as a very effective treatment for atrial fibrillation. And indeed, there are studies now looking at whether this should be in selected patient, in selected patients, the first line treatment to try to restore normal rhythm and do so in a durable fashion with low risk and minimal toxicity because in general, the risk is directly associated with the procedure itself and you don't need to be uh, maintained on these medications then for long periods of time. Um, so as this technology has improved, the procedure has become safer and more effective and more durable over time. And we could spend a whole session talking about that and hopefully uh, future sessions could look at that. Now, the other area that I will spend more time discussing um, is stroke prevention. And this is something that all cardiologists and even general internal medicine doctors think about and worry about in their patients with atrial fibrillation. I've described why patients with atrial fibrillation are increasing risk of stroke uh, because of the immobility of the tissue of the uh, cardiac atria, the filling chambers. And those chambers have nooks and crannies and particularly one big nook called the left atrial appendage that we'll review a little bit uh, in, later in the talk but blood clots can form there and can then be pumped into the systemic circulation. That is the circulation that goes to the rest of the body. And those clots can go places where they are not intended to go. Most notably, they can be pumped up to the brain, which is really the first stop of the blood flow as it leaves the heart and cause a stroke. So we, we base our stroke prevention in the setting of atrial fibrillation based on what we think your risk of having a stroke is in the setting of AFib. And then we generally will recommend treatment with an oral anticoagulant or a special type of blood thinner. These are really the mainstays of stroke prevention for atrial fibrillation. For many decades, the only option in, in this category was, was Coumadin or Warfarin, or some people know as rat poison because it is used as a uh, component of certain types of um, anti-pest agents. But it is also historically one of the, the most effective blood thinners around. Um, it, it blocks vitamin K metabolism in the body and vitamin K, as it turns out, is an important component of many of the proteins that are used to form blood clots in our blood. Um, over the past 10 years or so, because of some of the limitations with, uh, with warfarin or Coumadin, um, newer medications have been developed that don't require monitoring and don't require dose adjustments, um, and these are and don't require any dietary uh, management. Um, warfarin, because it is a vitamin K um, blocker or antagonist, then requires patients to be mindful of their vitamin K intake and leafy green vegetables and certain types of meats and other foods that people sometimes eat frequently. Um, can contain vitamin K and can counteract, act, act as an antidote to, to Coumadin or Warfarin. So you have to follow some pretty strict dietary um, guidelines when taking uh, Coumadin or Warfarin. Um, these newer medications like Eliquis, Zarelto, Perdaxa, and uh, Savesa do not have those same restrictions when it comes to diet. They do not require uh, blood monitoring. And now they all have reversal agents that are really readily available uh, over the, um, you know, from the pharmacy. Um, and so these have really risen to the fore as first line treatment. Um, when we come up, when we think about blood thinners for atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention, and you'll of course see these advertised on television, um, but beyond the advertisements, we have found that they are very safe and effective one compared even to, to warfarin for reducing the risk of stroke 
while minimizing the risk of bleeding that can come with taking a blood thinner. Now, we talked about assessing the risk of, of um, afibrillated stroke risk. So one of the things we're trying to counter, we're balancing that stroke risk against the bleeding risk that could come with taking a blood thinner. Now, bleeding risk is generally estimated at about 1% to 2% for most oral anticoagulants in the average patient. This can be higher with uncontrolled high blood pressure, kidney or liver disease. You've had a prior stroke interestingly, especially a bleeding type stroke or any prior bleeding problems. And we can have, we have ways of estimating what your bleeding risk may be and counterbalancing that against your stroke risk. So again, oral anticoagulant therapy is the mainstay in patients with atrial fibrillation with elevated stroke risk. Antiplatelet agents such as uh, aspirin or Plavix or clopidogrel are inferior to oral anticoagulants and generally shouldn't be used in patients um, in place of oral anticoagulants. Now you may see when in some of these advertisements um, for these blood thinners that they'll talk about if you have an artificial heart valve or certain heart valve conditions, you shouldn't take these medications. And that is true. There is an entity that we refer to as valvular atrial fibrillation. This is specifically atrial fibrillation that is related to having a condition called rheumatic mitral valve disease, usually rheumatic mitral stenosis. It is heart valve disease that is a result of or consequence of rheumatic fever, which thankfully in the United States and most of the developed world is very uncommon these days, but is still quite common in the developing world. Um, so either you have rheumatic mitral valve disease, or if you have a mechanical artificial heart valve, not a biological artificial heart valve, but a mechanical artificial heart valve. In those two circumstances, if you have AFib, you have to stick to warfarin because that is the only medication thus far that has been shown to be approved and effective uh, for preventing stroke in those scenarios. There are ongoing trials of some of these newer medications, but none of them have really um, come to the fore yet in showing us that those, al those alternate agents are effective for patients with valvular atrial fibrillation. So actually, let me just pause right here because I feel like there are was a couple of slides that might have been skipped. No, sorry about that. Okay, so one of the ways we assess stroke risk is we, we look at a patient's age and medical history, and there are scoring systems that are available um, uh, that we commonly use that are well validated that are based on age, gender, and then the presence of certain other health conditions, namely high blood pressure, history of prior stroke, um, congestive heart failure, or if you have any kind of um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, if you've had prior coronary heart disease, a myocardial infarction or heart attack, or if you've had blockages of the arteries leading to your legs or to other parts of the body um, that have required medical treatment. Um, each of those kind of gives you an extra point in terms of your risk, and we can score people from zero to nine using the scoring system. And basically, if you're, if you're at a score of, say, nine, your stroke risk on an annual basis approaches about 10% in the setting of atrial fibrillation, whereas if you have a score of zero, your risk is, is basically less than 1%. Once you get to a score of two to three in general, your stroke risk is somewhere on the order of three, two to three percent, and that is higher than, than the risk of bleeding with um, uh, blood thinning medications. And so in those situations, we generally would then recommend treatment with an oral anticoagulant or a blood thinner. So again, we're kind of talking about strategies to prevent stroke, and I, and I talked about that most of the strokes in atrial fibrillation are thought to result in blood clots that kind of form in, in this nook that comes off the heart. So if you look at the diagram on the left-hand side of the screen and you kind of go towards the bottom right here, there's this little kind of outpouching of the upper chamber um, that's sitting off the side of the heart there. That's called the left atrial appendage. And it's been thought to be perhaps some sort of pop-off valve for the left atrium, the filling chamber, there are some, um, there's some evidence that suggests that maybe the tissue there produces some types of hormones that are important for heart function. 
But as far as we can tell, you can do without this. And in fact, sometimes when people have open heart surgery for other reasons, the surgeons will ligate or sometimes remove, tie off or remove this structure and patients seem to do fine without it. And on the diagram on the right, you can see somebody who's in atrial fibrillation with these chaotic patterns of electrical activation in the left atrium, resulting in this rapid heart rhythm. And then the heart kind of quivers back and forth rather than, than the chamber contracting in a nice synchronized way. And that's where you can form blood clots. And it's estimated that in the setting of atrial fibrillation, 90% or so of the blood clots are gonna form in this outpouching called the left atrial appendage. So that has led us to believe that ligation or isolation of the left atrial appendage or LAA may help reduce the risk of stroke or systemic embolization, that is blood clots going to the rest of the body in the setting of AFib. And a number of percutaneous devices, that is minimally invasive devices that can be inserted into a blood vessel through a needle puncture in the skin um, have been developed to try to find a way to prevent stroke for patients who have non-valvular AFib without using medications, basically. I should emphasize that these procedural-based approaches um, are not necessarily better than using blood thinners, um, but are th thought to be what's, what's called in the sort of statistical jargon, non-inferior. So they're not worse, but they're not better. We think they're about the same in terms of their overall performance in reducing stroke. Um, as shown in, in major clinical trials. But I like to emphasize to my patients that it doesn't necessarily work better. So you shouldn't see it as something that is superior to using a blood thinner. So here's a typical case of this kind of situation. 62-year-old man who has permanent atrial fibrillation. So he's in atrial fibrillation. He hasn't been able to get converted out of it. Maybe he tried a cardioversion and he reverted to AFib over time. So now we're just managing the heart rate and we're managing the stroke risk also has diabetes mellitus and liver cirrhosis with varices, which are abnormal blood vessels in the esophagus that can occur with, with, as a consequence of the cirrhosis. And these are prone to bleeding. And sure enough, this gentleman has had episodes of bleeding and has had a recent cerebellar stroke um, when he was not taking blood thinners because of his episodes of bleeding. So he's had a stroke and he's been put on warfarin now and the idea is we don't want to keep him on warfarin because we know if we keep him on blood thinner long enough, the, the varices he has are going to cause more bleeding. So we decide in that case that a left atrial appendage occlusion procedure or closure procedure may be helpful to have to avoid being on an anticoagulant long term. So a number of devices have been developed so we can perform catheter-based left atrial appendage occlusion. Again, this doesn't require us to open the chest or do some sort of um, incision type of thing where you're going into the heart um, through the outside. We get in through a blood vessel, namely a vein in the leg through a needle puncture and insert a plastic tube or a catheter under ultrasound and x-ray guidance and go up into the heart, into the appendage, as I'll show you. Um, so there's a variety of plugs that have been developed um, devices to basically put a lasso around the outside of the appendage. So I'll just go through a couple of these that have now come to uh, uh, the fore for use in the United States. So the two devices that we use to plug the appendage are called the Watchman device and the Amulet device. And these are similar in that they have some sort of disc-like structure that is made of a metal mesh covered with some fabric. Um, that can be stretched out so it can fit into a plastic tube that is about as big around in diameter as a ballpoint pen. And that can then be delivered through a vein in the leg up into the heart and then positioned under x-ray and ultrasound guidance. And then once we're happy with the position, we op fully open the device, we test it to make sure the position is stable and that it's forming a good seal, and then we release it. So let me show you actually how this works. I'm gonna close my presentation for just a minute. And I'm going to go over here to this video. And I'm going to go to full screen here. So hopefully everybody can see this. Now I've turned off the audio because I want to just narrate this. So here we are, we've put a tube into the vein in your leg. So they've cut away your skin. So here, this tan colored thing here is the vein in the leg. And this blue thing, which kind of looks like a little straw or something, is, is a little tube that we put into the vein and it serves as a portal to get into the circulation. 
And then through that, we thread a longer, thinner tube that's gonna go all the way up through the vein under X-ray and ultrasound guidance up into the right side of the heart. Now the left atrial appendage is on the left side of the heart. So we need to get from right to left. So we go from the right-sided filling chamber through a thin barrier between the right and the left called the intraatrial septum. And we use a specialized apparatus under ultrasound and X-ray guidance to puncture across this in a very precise location so that we can point directly towards the opening of the left atrial appendage. And you'll see that here. And we get this small tube in and then we put a little flexible metal wire in and that'll give us a, a rail to deliver this larger tube through which we can then deliver our device. And we direct this into the left atrial appendage. Here's what this appendage looks like. It almost looks like a little ear coming off the side of the left atrium here. And as this animation is gonna show us, this can come in different shapes and sizes that vary from one individual to the next. And so we assess this by putting this little catheter or plastic tube in, and then we inject some X-ray dye and take a picture of it. And we can visualize this with X-ray as will be shown here. It looks like smoke, but it's X-ray dye. And then once we kind of get a map of this, we can pick the size device that we need using this and some measurements from ultrasound. And then we will withdraw this sleeve and, and open up this device. We partially open it to make this little ball we're happy with the position. We fully, fully retract the sleeve and fully open the device. We can retract it and reposition it until we get it into the optimal position. And then once we're happy with it, we will open the device again, do a few assessments. And if we're happy with that, we will then detach it from that delivery cable. And then it anchors itself with these little hooks that go into the tissue um, and secure it into position. And then over a period of about six months or so, the body will grow a skin-like layer of tissue over the front of the device, as you'll see depicted here in just a sec. And that will become incorporated into the structure of the left atrium. And therefore, later when we come off blood thinners, any blood clots that form behind this thing inside the body of the left atrial appendage will now no longer be able to come out and communicate with the rest of the circulation. This does require short-term treatment with an anticoagulant like Eliquis or Warfarin, um, but the nice thing about it is you don't need long-term treatment with a, a potent blood thinner. We can eventually get patients onto um, what we call low-dose aspirin, um, where the bleeding risk is much lower and um, generally avoid bleeding complications related to stronger blood thinners. Um, so that's that procedure. Um, so. Again, the indications for this is to reduce the risk of thromboembolism, that is blood clots that form in the heart and go elsewhere to the body, um, in, especially from the left atrial appendage in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation who have an indication for anticoagulation. That is, your stroke risk has been assessed to be high enough to warrant treatment. Um, you're suitable generally for some blood thinner for some period of time. It used to traditionally be warfarin, but it can be one of the newer agents. In fact, we preferentially tend to use um, Eliquis, which we find to be um, lower bleeding risk, especially at a lower dose. And we just need you to be able to take that for generally a period of a couple of months or so. And have a reason why we should avoid using a medication long-term, specifically a medication like Eliquis. And that usual reason is a history of a bleeding problem that is not likely to be completely cured and can recur over time. Although we sometimes will use this strategy in patients who have a strong personal preference to be off of a blood thinner, perhaps because of an active lifestyle. They're, you know, they're very into skiing or mountain biking or um, working outdoors, and they don't like the bruising and bleeding that can come with being on an anticoagulant long term. Contraindications: If you already have a blood clot inside your left atrial appendage, we can't put something in there at that time. We would have to treat with blood thinner for some period of time and make that dissolve. Um, if you've had something been, that's been placed across your uh, atrial septum, like a PFO closure device or an ASD closure device, or if the anatomy of the appendage is unsuitable by, um, by our assessment, that's a pretty rare phenomenon, particularly with these newer iteration devices. For the watchman, you need to, um, it traditionally used to say aspirin and warfarin for 45 days. We generally will do Eliquis alone for a month and a half after the implant. Then we um, assess with an ultrasound how the device looks, make sure there's no significant leakage around it. And if there isn't, um, we can then switch to aspirin and a cousin of aspirin called Plavix or Clopidogrel for up to six months. And then at six months, we drop the Clopidogrel and generally do aspirin alone. 
The trials all use 325 milligrams of aspirin. We tend to go down to 81 milligrams of aspirin just to minimize bleeding risk. For the amulet device, which is a newer device just approved in the past year, um, aspirin and Plavix are recommended for six months and then only uh, aspirin alone thereafter. This is just kind of an x-ray image of, uh, it'll be black and white of us assessing an appendage. Here's our catheter sitting in the left atrial appendage. You can see kind of the filling of this thing kind of sticking out here. And then in the next video that I'll show you, it, it might be hard to see with the resolution of the screen. I apologize, but we basically have a watchman device sitting in the appendage. And you can see that x-ray dye is no longer able to penetrate through to the back of the appendage here. So it's already completely sealed. So this would be a device we would release um, and, and leave it in the body. Another approach that's been used for this um, is uh, called the Lariat. It uses a, a really kind of um, interesting um, technique where a tube is put in through the right atrium, puncture across to the left atrium into the appendage, and it has a little magnet at the end. And then separately, another tube is put in on the outside of the heart through a needle puncture in the chest wall, and that has a magnet at the end. And then you join the two magnets, so you basically create a little rail and then over the outer tube, out of the outer kind of catheter tube, you bring this little lasso device that will go over the neck of the, of the appendage and allow you to then tie it off by applying a little suture there. And then eventually it will atrophy away and basically become non-existent. Um, this is a little technically more challenging and also um, is limited by the size of the appendage. If your appendage is a little bit on the larger side, you can't get this lasso around it. You can't do this. The one advantage of the lariat procedure is you don't require any blood thinner at any time, even aspirin. You don't need anything. So if somebody really has super high bleeding risk, um, this might be the better option. So take home points tonight. Atrial fibrillation is common, dangerous, and costly. Maintaining a healthy lifestyle to prevent common chronic conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity can help prevent atrial fibrillation. Management of atrial fibrillation is focused on controlling symptoms and preventing stroke. Anticoagulant medications are the mainstay for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. Left atrial appendage occlusion is an alternative when long-term use of these medications is not feasible or desired. So I think with that, I will stop here and open it back up to Kate to take questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Um, we loved those videos. Thank you for engaging us in that way. It was fascinating to watch. And um, we do have some questions ready. I'll start with the first one from an anonymous attendee asking, is AFib the same thing as arrhythmia? And are they one and the same? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, Arrhythmia is a generalized term that is basically medical jargon for abnormal heart rhythm. So it can refer to any type of abnormal heart rhythm, a fast abnormal heart rhythm, a slow abnormal heart rhythm. We can subdivide it into tachyarrhythmias, which are fast abnormal heart rhythms, and bradyarrhythmias, which are slow abnormal heart rhythms. But it's a, just a generic term for an abnormal heart rhythm. Atrial fibrillation is a specific type of abnormal heart rhythm. It is a specific tachyarrhythmia, fast abnormal heart rhythm, and it is probably amongst adults the most common arrhythmia other, other than having a fast heart rate when you're in normal rhythm. Um, but it is the most common abnormal heart rhythm. But it is not, it, the terms arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation are not synonymous. One is a more general term, arrhythmia. Atrial fibrillation refers to a more specific entity. Thank you. Our next question is also from an anonymous attendee asking, can you have AFib even with a pacemaker in place? And if so, why? That's a terrific question. And, and um, even as a cardiology trainee, it took me a little time to get my wrap my head around some of these concepts. So I will hopefully try to clarify this for you. So, a pacemaker is used to treat slow heart rhythms or to prevent slow heart rhythms. So if your heart's built-in electrical system either cannot generate an adequate heart rate for your degree of activity, 
or for some reason, because of wear and tear of the electrical fibers or damage to those fibers by an extraneous source like open heart surgery, those fibers cannot transmit those electrical signals properly so that the pumping chambers are just beating way too slow. A pacemaker is implanted and what the pacemaker does is monitor your heart rate. And if your heart rate is at all lower than a pre-programmed threshold of that pacemaker, that threshold can vary depending on activity, but there's certainly a bottom number that your heart rate will not be allowed to drop below. It will monitor your heart rate. And if your heart rate drops below that rate, then the pacemaker will send its own generated electrical signals to stimulate your heart to beat more rapidly, to meet that higher heart rate threshold. Now, if your heart is going fast, the pacemaker really can't do anything. It will notice that your heart rate is above that program threshold and say, I've got nothing to do here. The heart rate is adequate, okay? Now, there is a different type of device called an implantable cardioverter defibrillator or ICD that has the additional functionality of when it sees the heart rate go too fast above a pre-programmed high heart rate threshold, usually something very, very fast, like 180 or 200 beats per minute or more that could represent a very dangerous abnormal heart rhythm that is emanating or originating from the pumping chambers of the heart, usually in the setting of a weak heart muscle or scar due to a previous heart attack. Those types of heart rhythms can lead to sudden death. And so the defibrillator, if it sees you going that fast, will do two things. Number one, it'll try to stimulate your heart to be faster than that for a short period of time to kind of break the cycle and get you back into a normal rhythm. And if that's not effective enough, it will meanwhile charge a capacitor that will then deliver a large electrical jolt to your heart. Similar to when they, you know, you see in the movies when they put the pads on and they say clear and they jolt the patient and you see the patient bounce off the table. It's doing it from the inside. And that's called a, an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. That's for a whole separate issue. That's not used to treat atrial fibrillation. So if you have a simple pacemaker that is not an ICD, the pacemaker can't do anything about the fast heart rate. And so you can have a fib in the setting of the pacemaker. Now, the question is if the, if the reason for the pacemaker to begin with was that electrical signals from the bottom chamber, from the top chambers of the heart can't go to the bottom, well, then the only thing the AFib is going to do to you is put you at a risk for stroke. And so you still need to address that stroke risk. But you may not have the issues with the faster heartbeat and symptoms that would result from that if you have a pacemaker because you had a slow heart uh, rhythm to begin with. I hope that um, that answers the question because it is not a simple concept. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Um, for those who have questions, please find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You may have covered this next one, Dr. Hassan. The question is, what is considered a low dose aspirin? 81 or 325 milligrams? So low dose aspirin is 81 milligrams. Okay, 81 milligrams, at least in the United States. In Europe, it will go down to as low as 75. So, but in general, in the United States, when we say low dose aspirin, we're generally talking about something that's less than 100 milligrams and generally is marketed at 81 milligrams. Full dose aspirin is 325 milligrams. We will give that in cases where somebody is having a heart attack, for example. Um, it was previously used um, and sometimes still is used when somebody has had a watchman device put in and we are de-escalating the blood thinning from a full anticoagulant down to what we call antiplatelet agents like aspirin and Plavix. I generally don't like to use the full dose aspirin because I don't think the added benefit in terms of the stroke risk reduction is worth the increased bleeding risk. So I've stuck to 81 milligrams in these cases and, and that's worked fine for my patients, thankfully. Uh, but that is the, the difference between those two doses. Great. 
Another anonymous question is, how long does the watchman last and will it need to be replaced over time? So that's a great question. So um, the watchman is intended to be permanent. Um, it is implanted. It becomes incorporated into your body's tissue. You have a skin like layer of tissue that will grow over it, over the, over the face of it. So unless somebody were to have surgery to remove it, it will remain part of you in, until your demise. So it is not meant to, it will not need to be removed or replaced. The only circumstance in which I could imagine it being removed is if shortly after the implantation, it, its position changes and it's leaking. But even then, generally what we try to do is not try to pull it out because I think that would be potentially dangerous. What we try to do then is put some small little what we call plug devices around it to try to seal up the, 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 the gap. Now I'll tell you, the need for that kind of thing is, is very, very small, particularly with the, these newer iteration devices. We're on the second iteration of the Watchman device um, and the amulet is, has design features that really make it much easier to position it well and avoid um, any movement of the device after it's been, it's, it's been implanted. Um, so generally, I would not imagine a, a circumstance in which you have to have it removed or replaced. This question is from Margaret. A friend had ablation procedure for a AFib. Can you comment on this? I understand it may not be permanent. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so again, I'll give the caveat um, that I am, um, I'm not one of the people who performs ablations, even though I perform minimally invasive catheter-based procedures. That is really the forte of my um, cardiac electrophysiology colleagues or our heart rhythm specialists who really developed a focus in this. What I can tell you is um, when I started my training um, in cardiovascular medicine uh, back in 2009, um, we didn't think of ablation as being the most effective procedure. We, we tended to see that patients would need to come back for a second or sometimes third procedure to get a really durable result. And there was still some risk over time, we're talking about over years, that the atrial fibrillation could potentially recur. Um, what has changed over time is I think the technology and the techniques have improved. So I think right now with a single ablation procedure, um, in, in the right patients, um, you can get a good durable result um, that it, you know 10 plus years you go and not have recurrent atrial fibrillation. Now, there are certain circumstances that may um, increase the risk of AFib recurrence. So if the heart structure itself has changed uh, because of high blood pressure, valvular heart disease, and in particular, if your left atrium is really enlarged, um, then it may be hard to get rid of the AFib forever. Um, if you have untreated heart valve disease or coronary heart disease, it also, those are things that could stimulate recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Or if you have been having atrial fibrillation for a very long time, that also decreases the probability that the atrial fibrillation can be durably treated or eliminated. So the best circumstance in which to get an ablation is if you're kind of early in your, in your um, struggle with atrial fibrillation. Maybe you've had some bouts on and off over a couple of years, but you've not had really long bouts that have lasted months or years on end. Um, that would be a good situation in which to talk to your physicians about um, the possibility of an ablation and whether you'd be a good candidate for it. Great, thank you. Next question is, if you have sporadic AFib, approximately one, once every one to three years, how does that change the recommendation for an anticoagulant? Yeah, that's interesting. So um, a couple of comments there. So first of all, there are some bouts of atrial fibrillation and some patients can be asymptomatic. So I've had some patients who don't feel it very often, but if we put a heart monitor on, on them, they're having it more frequently than they know. If it is truly that sporadic, then your risk of stroke is likely lower. And so um, 
we may not be as aggressive in recommending an oral anticoagulant treatment depending on your age and your other health history. Now, if you were over the age of 75 and you told me you've had a history of longstanding high blood pressure, diabetes, and you've had a coronary heart disease, and you've had a couple of bouts of AFib, I may still be concerned enough to keep you, put you on an oral anticoagulant if your bleeding risk is low, because there's a fair chance as you get older, the frequency of atrial fibrillation will increase and your, and your stroke risk in the setting of AFib will be higher. Um, so I think it's a very individualized approach, but certainly if it's the patients I see you tend to have more sporadic episodes, also tend to be younger and at lower stroke risk in general. And so it may uh, be reasonable in those cases not to use an oral anticoagulant when you put the whole picture together. Great. Next question. Why are insurance companies pulling away from covering newer meds such as Eliquis if they are better? Is there a good reason to give them to get coverage or get them to give coverage? So the short answer to that question is because insurance companies want to make money um, or at least save money. So um, they tend to be very finicky about paying for newer things, which are still covered by patents. And therefore the manufacturer of, let's say the pharmaceutical or the device can name their price. Um, what we find is over time as medications, as the patents um, expire, and generic forms can enter the market, then obviously that pushes down the prices and generally makes it easier to get access to these medications. What I tend to find right now is most insurance companies will reasonably cover one of these newer oral anticoagulants reasonably well, but will not cover the whole spectrum of them. And I don't know if they, how, why or that is, if they do some sort of negotiation or what, but, um, I think the bottom line is, you know, insurance companies want to try to save medicine, save money. Now I've found they're covering some of the newer medications more because the overall costs tend to be lower. You know, if you're on warfarin, even though the warfarin itself may be dirt cheap, you've got to pay for lab blood draws every so often. You've got to pay for the maintenance of the medication. If patients have two levels that are too high or too low, those can lead to complications and hospital stays and increased healthcare costs associated with that. So I think these companies are wisening up to the fact that the, while the medication itself may cost more, the cost over the long term in the individual patient um, may be less. Great. Um, Gordon and Grace Wu are asking, how about the risk of allergies? Um, so I guess I want some clarification as to, are you worried about allergies to the medications um, versus say the medical devices we're putting in? So I'll try to address both. Um, I haven't heard of anybody having an allergy to these blood thinning medications in general. Um, usually the, the, the thing that we worry about the most typically is bleeding complications that can come with being on a blood thinner. In terms of allergies to the devices, um, these devices do cause, do contain a metal alloy called nitinol, which contains nickel. And some people can have reactions or allergies to nickel, believe it or not. But these days, these alloys are treated such that there's a minuscule amount of nickel that would elute into the bloodstream. And so generally, even if somebody has a true nickel allergy that usually manifests as a skin rash when wearing jewelry that is not fine jewelry, it's not made of gold or silver, let's say, so it tends to contain nickel. Um, those people are generally not gonna have a reaction to the device. And so we really don't worry about allergies when it comes to these devices. Here's a question that I was actually also interested in. Is the watchman usually outpatient or does it involve a hospital stay? Terrific question. Um, so when this uh, technology was first rolled out, um, a, a overnight hospital stay was sort of mandated, but we kind of found that was kind of silly because most patients are coming in, having this done electively, are generally feeling well when they're having this done because it is an elective procedure. Mm -hmm. We're doing it really for preventative purposes. And um, most patients tolerate the procedure just fine. You do have to be put to sleep under general anesthesia so you can tolerate having um, this ultrasound, this endoscopic ultrasound, we call a transesophageal echo 
in place to guide the procedure. Uh, but most patients can wake up right after the procedure from the anesthesia and emerge with no issue. And after several hours of bed rest could be able to get back you know, to walking and get into their car and go home as long as they have a responsible adult to drive them home. So we have really moved to doing these as outpatient procedures. Now they need to be done within the hospital facility uh, for a variety of reasons, but we do them as outpatient procedures. Now, right now, in terms of our Hopkins uh, family, the only site where we're doing these procedures is the Johns Hopkins Hospital up in Baltimore. But I have been working over the past several years with partners at Suburban Hospital to bring this technology to Suburban. We were delayed a bit, mostly really by the pandemic. But now that we're really hopefully coming towards more of an end, I guess an endemic rather than pandemic situation, um, we're, we're ready to expand services again. And so right now we're literally just waiting for negotiations between Johns Hopkins and Boston Scientific to basically agree on pricing and, and stocking of the device so we can put it on the shelves and then we can start doing these procedures. We were actually hoping to start this month, but in, my guess is it'll probably be bumped till, uh, till September. But um, in the very near future, we hope to be doing these in suburban hospital. I currently will evaluate patients for their candidacy for the procedure at Suburban. We have a clinic there that I'm typically there about three times a month. And so right now we, we bring the patients up to Baltimore for the procedure. But like I said, I think in the coming month or two, hopefully we can start doing everything the, from the evaluation to the follow-up all under the same roof at Suburban Hospital. All right. Um, this next question has a, a couple points in it from an anonymous attendee. Is there some criterion approximate number of years of taking oral anticoagulants at which the person's general health, health situation should be particularly reviewed regarding health cost and benefit of taking the oral anticoagulant versus some alternative means of reduce, reducing stroke risk? For example, after 15 or 20 years of an oral anticoagulant, would a person's age be a factor of consideration? I don't think the age per se um, and duration of anticoagulant therapy is necessarily something where you say, well, you've been on this for 20 years, we need to switch to a different strategy. I think the patient's um, overall health status probably assessed at least annually as something we would consider. We would look at you and say, okay, what is your stroke risk and what is your bleeding risk? And does it make sense to be on, to continue to be on this medication? Um, what may change over time, your, your stroke risk will only increase as, with increasing age. What may also increase is your bleeding risk. And at some point, if there's a bleeding complication or concern for increased bleeding risk because of changes in, in other aspects of your health status, then we might say, well, maybe it's not a good idea to keep this oral anticoagulant on. Maybe we need to think of an alternative strategy like left atrial appendage occlusion. Um, you know, the other thing can change is obviously if somebody's health status changes where you're getting towards end of life, if there's a terminal illness, that might be a situation where you think of coming off the anticoagulant and not pursuing any other strategy entirely, because at that point, your life expectancy may be such that it doesn't make sense. Right, thank you. Next question is from Mr. Lempert. Are AFib readings in apps such as the Cardia, K-A-R-D-I-A, app reliable? Um, the Cardia app in particular is pretty good, as I understand. It's been shown to be fairly accurate when compared to more conventional means. I can tell you the Apple Watch, the latest iteration, does have a, an algorithm for trying to predict atrial fibrillation. But what I have gleaned from the studies of that is that it tends to overcall the, um, the occurrence of atrial fibrillation. And so I think it's still important to get a good old fashioned EKG or cardiac monitor to confirm the diagnosis and document it in your, in your medical record. But um, I think if you've had an established diagnosis, the Cardia app in particular can be very help, helpful in assessing whether you're having a recurrence of AFib or not. All right. And our last question is from Suzanne. Do you recommend 
and forgive me if I'm pronouncing this wrong, COQ10 to patients on, to patients AFib on Elquist. Um, so I, there are, uh, I think Suzanne is referring to coenzyme Q10 or sometimes referred to colloquially as CoQ10. And I don't, um, I'm, I'm not read or, or seen any um, study or, or anything else that would show a clear benefit of using CoQ10 in the setting of Eliquis. Where CoQ10 can be helpful is in patients who are taking statin medications and are having what we call myalgias or muscle aches or pains due to the statin, CoQ10 can sometimes alleviate that and make it so that the patient can better tolerate the statin medication when it's medically indicated. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Thank you to our attendees tonight for these fantastic questions. You brought us right up to the top of the hour. So we thank you for taking the time to participate today. We understand there you may have been cut off at the beginning, um, but please rest assured the link to this entire recording will be going out to you very soon. Um, and as tonight, as you hit the leave button on the bottom of the screen, a link to our evaluation will pop up on your screen. It will take just two minutes to complete. And it really does help guide the um, programming that we provide throughout the year free of charge to you so that you can stay informed and engaged in your health decisions for both you and your family. So thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Kate from Community Health and Wellness and we thank Dr. Hassan for teaching us about this new minimally invasive procedure. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, take care.